Hello. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of the Jason Cavanis Experience Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. I'm also the CEO founder of Cavanis HR. At Cavanis HR, we provide HR to companies with 49 or fewer people by automating HR products and services while providing access to a dedicated HR business partner. This podcast, I'll be covering the HR laws you have to follow if you have a company with 49 or fewer employees. Also, so I also have, I have like a slight cough, so I'll be coughing a little bit. So excuse me for that. And I'll be drinking coffee hop with that, of course. First, we're covering those laws if you have one, one employee or more. So the first one is the Drug, Drug Free Workplace Act of 1988. And this is actually causes a lot of confusion. This act actually only applies if you are receiving federal grants or have a federal contract of worth $100,000 or more. So in reality, most private companies do not need a drug, drug place, workplace act. Now, a lot of you will still do this. You'll do drug testing for different reasons. Now the drug testing, to me, there's a big difference between HR laws and what you have to have for insurance, right? And so for example, let's suppose you have a donut shop. You have a cashier and a person making the donuts. And let's say one day the donut shop burns down. And so you have your cashier who has nothing to do with the prime donuts, has nothing to do with the donut making, only uh, he's just a cashier. I suppose that person is smoke stuff, right? Does that matter? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Now, let's suppose the person making the donuts is at fault for burning down the donut shop. Now, if he's smoking dope, that's probably make a difference as far as insurance, right? But strictly for, for the HR law side, only requirement for a drug free workplace act, any kind of drug free policy is that if your contract, if you have a contract with the government of $100,000 or more. Also, while I remember, so I'm doing this, like a, I'm not doing deep dive any of this stuff, like a 30,000 foot or above, like you. Also, we're all, I'm only covering the federal HR laws. There's other laws you might have to follow based on your location, whether your state, uh, local government, other things too. And not to talk politics, but usually, if you're in a place that we'll say is like more conservative, the less HR laws you have, if you're more like liberal, you probably have more HR laws. Of course, there's that's a generality of that specific each place. So next we're gonna cover the Electronic Communication Act. So basically, this law prohibits you from spying your people using oral communication. For example, you can't put like a recording device underneath the desk of your people and record it, right? Now, some people would say, well, how do I keep my people from stealing or, you know, stuff like that? Well, that you can still videotape them. This can't be anything oral. So you can put up videotapes or video cams all over your office, whatever, but you're not allowed to orally record them. And we, in obsession, I record the private conversations. And people might say, well, how do I, if I'm doing sales calls or training, how do I cover that? That does not cover this. This is specifically preventing you from spying on your people. Next, we're going to talk about the Employee Polygraph Act. So this forbids most companies from uh, using a polygraph on their employees. Now, there are some exceptions. For example, if your company is into like um, transporting money from bank to bank, it's not covered by this. Also, if you're like uh, dealing with medical stuff, it's not covered by this. And there are some examples where any company can use this, right? So an example I used, So example I use is, let's suppose you have a car wash that you own and you've had a customer coming to you for years. A customer comes to you and says, hey, um, I'll call you Bob. Hey, Bob, you know I've been coming here for a while, but the last three times I came, each time I had something stolen from my car. Like first time I had like this stolen, second time this stolen, third time this stolen. Now, as a small business owner or the owner in general, you can't go, okay, I'm gonna give everyone a polygraph case, right? You have to like narrow it down some. So of course, what I should have said, like if there are instances where you think there's theft from your business, you do do a polygraph test. However, there's like requirements, right? So you can't like, suppose you have 25 people working for you, you can't bring all 25 of them and make them take a polygraph test. You have to do research and say, okay, 
on three these three days during this time period, who is at work, right? And suppose all three of those days, these five people working there. And then let's suppose one of them was a cashier who never leaves a cashier's case. Well, you, you can't do, her, do a polygraph for her. So you have four people who like wash cars, all four work in the day and time. This person says something was stolen. Now those four, you can give them a polygraph test. However, you can't do yourself right. You have to get someone qualified to do the polygraph test for you. And of course, as you sure you know, I think in most places in the United States, a polygraph test is not admissible in court. So polygraph test, polygraph test is probably not something you're going to do. Next is uh, the Employment Retirement Income Security Act, or ERSA. So this is something I'm not really knowledgeable about, but if you reach out to me and need more information, I can connect you to some people. But basically, this regulates benefits through a complex series of rules covering pensions, profit sharing, stock bonus, and other insurance and benefits plans. So next, we're going to talk about the Military Leave, Uniform Services, Employment, and Reemployment Rights Act. So with this, this covers your military people. And so, for so example, suppose you have someone who works for you in the military, and they have to leave for a year on a deployment, either with the National Guard or Reserves, or the case may be. How the law is written, let's suppose, let's suppose Bob's, let's say John's in the military, and Susan, you know, stays back, right? A year goes by. Let's say Susan gets a promotion, Susan gets a raise. Even though Bob hasn't been there for a year, by law, you still have to get that to Bob. Even though he's not there because he's serving his country, you're required to give him the same, everything that your regular workers, right? I would say regular workers, but a person who's not deployed or standing, you have to get. But on the, right, on the other side of that, there are also requirements for a military person, right? For example, if like we'll say um, Mary, gets orders on January 1st that she's going to have to go for military for a year with the National Guard, right? She can't wait until May 15th to tell you about it, right? As soon as the person finds out, they have to tell you. So always keep that in mind. Of course, you already want to really want to take care of military veterans. But there are requirements on both sides. Next, we're going to talk about what's called the hazardous chemicals in the workplace or employees' right to know law. So basically, it's a rule that requires private sector employees with hazardous substances in the workplace to develop a comprehensive hazard communication plan. So basically, uh, safety data sheets, right? So suppose you have like a dangerous chemical. I can't think of a dangerous chemical off the head, but suppose like there's a dangerous chemical that you use. At your, so example, I used to, for example, you used to work at Trader Seafoods, got all kind of, I think, ammonia stuff in there, right? So we had like safety, safety data sheets showing what to do in case something bad happened with the ammonia or with the chemical, right? That's something you have to have. Next, the National Labor Relations Act. So the you know, employees have the right to organize and bargain collectively for wages, hours, and work conditions. So work conditions is basically, we think about it could be anything, right? So let's suppose like you get birthday cakes out for birthdays, right? Well, that's a work condition, right? Basically anything can be covered with working conditions, right? Now, let's suppose that your, your working place is not unionized, but the union comes in and tries to unionize your people, right? Uh, whether it's right or wrong, fair or not right, the union definitely has an advantage when trying to unionize your workplace, right? So, for example, you as a small business owner cannot talk to your people one-on-one. -on -one. You can't bring them to your office one-on-one -on -one to try to talk to them, right? That's undue influence. Well, the union can do that, right? So the union definitely has there's a lot of advantages trying to unionize your people, right? And the best way to prevent a union is like, you know, take care of people and treat your people the way you want them to be treated. Off, off a little subject, like a lot of people say, what's how, how do you become a, a good supervisor or be the best supervisor? To me, HR is not really that hard, right? Like if you're a supervisor, be the supervisor to your people that you want them, that you want your supervisor to be to you. I think that's where you, you keep unions out too. Um, so back to the unions, you definitely have advantage, right? But any, anything, that the courts can see to get the unit advantage of this, they will. For example, this happened a long time ago, I think North Carolina, like a manufacturing plant. So a unit tried to came, came to like try to unionize the place, right? And, and there's an election, right? And so the night before the election, the unit threw a big party for all the workers, right? You know, trying to smooth them, trying to get them to vote, right? And so one of the VPs of the company went by there and saw our employee leaving. And so he like got the employee, said, hey, employee, 
I see you coming from this you know, union party. If you work it where the union fails, I'll give you a promotion and I'll take care of you, right? And so the next day, the union actually failed in the election, right? They lost the election, right? But of course, they got back to the union leadership, what the senior VP of this company had did, right? Trying like, you know, I won't say bribe, I, I guess bribe the employer, right? And so they got back to the court. And so even though the union had lost like 90% of the vote, like 90% voted to keep the union out, because the court saw this as undue influence, the court then put the union in, right? So it's, it's a very, very tricky thing, right? So always be careful of that. Next is an Occupational Safety and Health Act. So basically, you need to have a workplace free of hazards, right? Something as simple as, like, you know, don't have cords hanging around. If you're working in a manufacturing plant, you have, like, you know, dangerous machinery, have the safety guards on there. So make sure you have a, a place where workers can, you know, be free from hazards and be safe. Next is the um, Equal Pay Act of 1964. So with this, this prohibits pay based on discrimination. I mean, this prohibits pay discrimination based on race, color, religion, national origin, age, and disability. Now you notice this says nothing about, you know, time on the job, uh, education, stuff like that. So there are factors you, you like, you know, differentiating your pay. And also, this is under the Equal Pay Act of 1963 and Title VII of the Civil, Civil Rights Act of 1964, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about later. So both of these prohibit discrimination of pay based on gender, but, you know, they differ on, like, coverage, enforcement, and remedy. Next, we're going to talk about the Fair Labor Standard Act. So with this, the basic rule is pay for all hours work and pay time and a half of over 40 hours, right? So example, I probably have the math wrong, but say, let's suppose, you know, you pay um, minimum wage in like Texas is 725. You have to pay 725 an hour for 40 hours a week. And then whatever the time and a half is for overtime. Another thing a lot of business owners get, uh, get confused about or don't do right is the overtime pay, right? You always have to pay for overtime. For example, suppose your worker comes to you and he says, hey, um, owner, in order to do my job this week, I need to work five hours extra, extra overtime to, do, to get my job, to get everything done, right? I suppose you say no, right? If this person still goes ahead and works those five hours of overtime, you still have to pay them. Like, you can't say, oh, I told you no, not to do the overtime. Every time these cases like this are going to court, the court has always ruled that the owner has to pay for overtime, right? So just be aware of that. Next is the Immigration Reform and Control Act. Basically, you know, regardless of what your take is on immigration, illegal immigration, in the case of you being, if you hire someone to work in the United States, they have to be authorized to work in the United States. And this is done through the I-9 form, uh, through documentation like driver's license, social security card, passports. So, and one thing I don't think most people know, once someone starts working, I like suppose someone starts working on Monday, by th three days have to prove to you they can work in the United States. So I think that's Thursday. By Thursday, they have to bring you documentation showing they can work in the United States. Now, of course, there's like, you know, different circumstances, like suppose they lost something, you know, they still have to prove they apply for it too, but like, Three days is the is the is the um is the deadline, so to speak. Next, federal income tax withholding. Withholding, of course, you know you have to withhold uh, federal tax taxes for your people. Also, Social Security you have to withhold Social Security. Next is the Health Insurance Portability Accountability or HIPAA. So this limits the duration of pre-existing conditions from your health group plan and gives new enrollees credit for prior coverage. So next, like I said, it's not a deep dive or anything. Like each one of these uh, subjects, I can do probably our presentation on. If you want more information, just reach out to me. So next, we're going to cover um, those HR laws at the federal level. You have to follow if you have 15 employees or more. Once again, these are employees, not contractors. So first is the uh, American with Disabilities Act. So this for forbids discrimination against the disabled. And so there's two parts of this, right? So the, when this law was first passed, it was basically was set up where like you had a disability. That's suppose like um, you lost your leg or suppose you know you went blind, right? Then this applied to you. But suppose like, you know, 
later on down the road, you had like, um, you had a replacement leg, you had LASIK surgery and you were, and you were able now to walk like, like anybody else. You could see like anyone else. These protections for disability went away. Well, in 2008, Congress decided they didn't like that. And so in 2008, they passed the ADA Amendments, Amendments Act of 2008. And so basically, this does basically says is once you're disabled, you're always disabled, right? So even like you might've lost your leg, lost your eyesight, even though you got a, got a fix, so to speak, and now you can see, and I can like walk around like anyone else. Those disability protections still apply to you. So when someone applies to your job and they ask for a reasonable accommodation or they say they're disabled and you look at someone and you think to yourself, you look personal, you know, you look perfectly like fine and mean, always get the background story, right? Because they may have been disabled in the past and are, and are actually disabled. Also with that, uh, there's a lot of uh, people, especially military veterans with PTSD who suffer depression and suffer other like mental health issues who are also considered disabled who might not look disabled. So always keep that in mind. Next, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act. So this forbids discrimination on pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. So one thing you definitely don't want to do, and this has actually happened to a couple of friends of mine the past two years, and I'll give you one example. I had a friend of mine, he's a software developer, like a mid-level, you know, developer, like been doing for four or five years. And so she applied for a job as a software developer, passed the phone screen, passed the Zoom, actually has two Zooms, so they had to come in to do an in-person interview, right? And it's with a startup. The startup had already raised some funding, right? And so they're doing pretty good. And they brought in for an interview. And during this whole time, she was like, I think five or six months pregnant, right? And of course, you can't tell that if you're on the, on the phone or the Zoom. So he goes to the office for the interview. And they're like, like she said, that one of the first things they said was like, we're sorry we wasted your time. If we didn't know you're pregnant, we already even got this far, right? Because obviously your child has to be a number one priority. You work for us, we want you to be a number one priority, right? So please don't do that, right? And keep in mind, like even though pregnancy, according to law, is a disability, they can still do their job and they're still gonna be a valuable a person for your workforce, right? So just don't discriminate because someone's pregnant. It's, it's just the wrong thing to do. Next is the uh, GINA uh, or Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. So this, this prohibits discrimination on the basis of genetic information, respect to your health insurance and employment. So what's happened in the past, like suppose like someone applied for a job with you and you, and you, and you, you know, and you get into the insurance, right? They take the medical test, whatever. And, and suppose a health insurance or medical test came back that this person is predisposed to have cancer or predisposed to have some kind of disease, right? Well, then the companies were not hiring them because the, they were thinking, okay, if I hire this person because it's predisposed to have cancer, their health insurance premiums are automatically going go up because the company saw this, health insurance company saw this, or if the person does get cancer or, some, or this other disease they're predisposed to, health premiums are going to go off, right? And then they would not get hired. So now this is no longer allowed. So next, uh, we're going to talk about Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So this prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. This applies if you have 15 or more people. And so people often ask, you know, can I fire people, so I, you know, get someone to go, right? And the answer is usually is if you're at will state. And most states are at will. I think there's like one or two exceptions. And surprisingly, even California's at will. You can let anyone go for any reason unless it's one of those reasons. Like you can't say, I'm going to, you know, terminate, you know, Jason Cabinets because he's white or I'm going to fire, you know, Billy Johnson because, you know, he's Roman or Catholic, whatever the case may be, right? So just keep that in mind. And then in a, there's a memo to this in, in, in 2020 that extended this prohibition of discrimination on the basis of sex to gay, lesbian, transgender individuals, right? So just keep in mind too, right? These protections from 1964 Civil Rights Act Starting in 2020 due to the Supreme Court decision, extends this prohibition, prohibition of discrimination on the basis of sex to gay, lesbian, and transgender individuals. Now, the United States 64 Act, there's one really huge demographic that's missing, right? So the United States 64 Act, you know, prohibit discrimination on the basis of color, race, religion, sex, and national origin. But for some reason, it wasn't until 1967 when the, uh, all these protections were 
afforded to people over, above the age of 40. So for a reason, Congress in 1964 just like didn't think about you know, protecting the rights of people over 40 or whatever, but they applied this in 1967. Another difference too is like the, the peer protections applied if you have a company with 15 or fewer people. The protection against age discrimination does not apply until you hit age 20. And so like a lot of like companies like, so we're best way, not, not the best way to kind of battery put this, like if your company has 15, 18 or less people, you can actually not hire people over 40, right? It's not the right thing to do, not, you know, not morally right, I don't think, but legally you can do it, right? So keep in mind too. So I know a lot of companies get, you know, get criticized for that right of control, but according to law, there's nothing to do about it, right? So maybe that needs to change too. And then the final HR law we're going to cover is um, COBRA, right? So with COBRA, basically, if, you're, if your company is like, you know, helping to pay for insurance for your people, right, and you let them go, they can keep the insurance coverage for a certain amount of time. Now, to me, I don't really see it as a benefit. So example, like, pose the, I'm making this up, pose the, the premium for, the, for this person, like we'll say it's $1,000 a month and you're paying 500, right? All this means is like, that person can keep the insurance, they pay $1,000 a month, right? Which is like, I don't know what kind of benefit that is, right? So this was like a quick down or dirty on these HR laws. Like I said, you, you probably have more HR laws depending on where you're at, you know? Or may, may not, for example, like the state of Idaho, they really don't have more, any more HR laws. It's like everything links to the federal government. Places like where I'm at, Seattle, San Francisco area, will probably have more HR laws. Um, like I said, you know, not talk politics, but those places like more conservative or more Republican, supposed to speak, will have less HR laws. However, that's not the case all the time. So, you know, the state of Texas is pretty conservative, but like cities like Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, they're going to have more HR laws, you know, for that, right? So keep in mind. Also, HR laws change all the time, so make sure you keep updated to them. Um, so this is a quick down to do the HR laws for you. So here at Kevin's HR, we're still, um, we're, right now we're working on a product market fit for our HR platform and validating our tech, you know, base, validating our tech platform. So what we're doing right now, if you're a um, small business in Seattle with 49 or fewer people, we want to do HR laws and employee handbook for you for free. So reach out to me for that. So we're trying to get a more product validation. Um, if you have any questions about anything, reach out to me at um, Jason Cabinets at cabinetshr.com or let me put my work, work number more fast. So I already had this pulled up. Or you can call me or text me at 206-707-2832. Uh, if you have any questions about anything HRA, let me know. I want to thank you for your time. And remember to be great every day.